What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Early Edge NFL Picture brought to you by BetMGM, the sports book born in Vegas. Will Brinson, RJ White, Mike McClure here to give you a full slate of week five of the NFL season. Worth noting that while we say it's a full slate, there are buys this week for the first time this year. I guess Larry, Larry Hartstein's on buy. Larry's buy. He, he drew the early week five buy. You got it. Would you see if, all right, if we gave, if you gave like us in the working sports media buys, and you got to pick when your buy would be, RJ. What week would you pick your buy to be? Thanksgiving week, obviously. Mm, smart. <laughs> Mike? I, I, yeah, I assume you're kicking that to me. Uh, yeah, it would probably be Thanksgiving week as well. Uh, I, you know, Unless there's just some massive college football game or like the Royals make the World Series, mm. I'll take that week off, something like that. Uh, otherwise, yeah, it's definitely around the holiday time. I like that look. Like Braves make the World Series, I take the buy and I just watch the Braves for you know a week and, and laugh about football and put my bets in with, without worrying about producing any content. We don't have such a luxury, mainly because the Braves are eliminated, but also because we got to talk about football, including a game in Atlanta. No Braves. We do get Falcons there. Bucks at Falcons. Interdivisional matchup here, RJ. We have. Uh, Atlanta favored by two and a half in this game with a total of 43 and a half. Um, I'm on the over in this one. I think when you look at this matchup, you see a team in uh, Tampa under Leah Cohen that or Leah Cohen, excuse me, has been running, like has been passing the ball a bunch. And Baker Mayfield has been very good. He's very comfortable with this offense. They had the weapons. No Jalen McMillan on Thursday night. Should see some Sterling Shepard. But of course, Chris Goblin, Mike Evans. Kate Otten, if you want to go that far, and then the, the two running backs and Bucky Irving uh, and Rashad White, I think they'll be able to pass pretty easily against Atlanta. And I think that will induce the Falcons into coming back against a Bucks defense that can be had against the past by sort of cranking up Atlanta's pass rate. Uh, just sort of one of those games where one team draws the other one in. Now, it could be dead wrong, could come out, pound Bijan to the line, you know, 50 times and, and, it, and it goes way under. But I do think that we see these two teams induce each other into passing more and we get points of plenty uh, when it comes to Bucks and Falcons on Thursday night. What about you? Or pound Bucky Irving. I mean, you know, the, the talk is that he's might get the most carries in this game. He may become RB one. We see that if reflected in the prop market where his over at, at bed MGM is 43 and a half right now in his rushing yards at minus minus one thirty to the over while well, Rashad White's about nine yards under that at 34 and a half. So it will be interesting to see if you want to fade that conventional wisdom and go with the Rashad White over or a Bucky Irving under whether that comes to pass. Um, I don't know what to do with this game just in general. I mean, Atlanta has been the better team on both sides of the ball in yards per play, but they have trouble scoring and Tampa Bay doesn't, you know, they're far better at scoring and limiting scoring and that Tampa Bay win, you want to, you know, upgrade them coming off a of win against a good Philly team, but that team had no receivers. Atlanta won 26-24, did not have an offensive touchdown in that game. So it's not like with 26 points, the offense was really humming along. So I don't know how to value either of these teams. Um, it's bounced be between one and a half and two and a half in this game. At two and a half, I'd probably lean to the underdog, just thinking it's going to be one of those typical NFC South close games that could land on one or two. Um, I probably, just because it's a primetime game, would lean to the under instead of the over. But but not, not a great look in either of these games. I think you might be muted there, but I, I'm when I look at this game here, I, I personally I can't get to anything here. My model is almost dead on both side and total. If you were fortunate enough to catch the Buccaneers at three at open, uh, I think that was a good look. I see we're trending back towards the Falcons here. Uh, I don't see any scenario it gets to three again before pregame. Uh, as far as the Bucky Irving steam, I, I'm on board with it. Uh, and, and I would point out too, not just in receiving yardage or, I mean, excuse me, rushing yardage, uh, looking at anytime touchdown scoring markets over at MGM currently, uh, Bucky Irving down to plus 150 anytime touchdown, Rashad White plus 185. That's about a 5% difference, which is pretty significant when you're talking about those two. So it's a pretty strong indication. We've seen a lot of speculation on Bucky Irving taking over. Uh, and I think it makes sense. Anytime you get a short week anyway, you start to see RB2 maybe get a few additional touches. Uh, but I think it flips and this becomes the week where we see Bucky be RB1 in this particular spot. So if I'm looking in this game, I'd be looking at Bucky Irving props, whether it's longest re rush over, over on total rushing yards, over over on attempts. Uh, but I couldn't get anywhere on side in total, just way too close to market. Yeah, thanks for reading my lips or reading my mind, whatever what, what it was. I would say whoever uh, goes first, the other one follow. With no Larry, we can just sort of three-man weave this. And I'll get right back to you, Mike, when we uh, we go to the Sunday slate with Jets at Vikings. A really low total here. 
considering we have Aaron Rodgers against Sam Darnold, a Sam Darnold revenge game, maybe a Garrett Wilson revenge game after Justin Jefferson threw shade in his face earlier this offseason. Vikings uh, out to that hot start. Sam Darnold, legitimate MVP candidate. Uh, they're hosting the Jets, uh, favored by two and a half with a very low total of 40 and a half here, Mike. Yeah, I think it's a revenge game for a lot of people. Maybe Aaron Rodgers, Nathaniel Hackett revenge game uh, after what they did last week against the Denver Broncos. I mean, it can't be much worse uh, than, than really what it was. You know, I think you see the low total. It, it makes sense when you travel to London and look at these two teams here. Uh, you know, the thought process is both of them are, are at least above average defensively. Uh, I'm still inclined to lean to the over just slightly, though, uh, at, at this number, 41 being a pretty key number in the NFL. I think that we're going to see some – some offense here. I think we're also maybe going to see uh, defense creating short fields for those offenses, but ultimately I think we see some efficiency in terms of scoring. Wouldn't shock me at all if the Jets were able to win this one. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to want to back the Vikings at this number under a field goal, uh, but just looking at my number here, I made it one and a half uh, for the Vikings. Uh, so just keeping in mind, this is not a home field advantage situation it is very much neutral field uh, across seas. So I lean towards the Jets lean towards the over 40 and a half. Yeah, I wanted to like the Jets too. Um, Minnesota's come a long way from a six and a half win total preseason. And this to me seems like a sleepy spot for them. They're heading into their bye. They're playing out of country. They're overperforming at 4-0. and And it seems like they could be probably caught by surprise maybe or, or just not as everything clicking as it has been in the first four weeks. The Jets absolutely need this win. They had a surprise loss against Denver. The schedule is not going to get tough moving forward. I think you're going to get like a, a max effort kitchen sink type of game here, knowing that they cannot afford to lose this game. Um, that Minnesota offense versus Jets defense is an elite matchup, particularly with the pass. And the Jets has the cornerback, have the cornerbacks to handle the Minnesota weapons. Uh, the Jets offense needs to switch it up because, you know, they, they had a lot of pressure brought against them against the Broncos and it worked magnificently, the Broncos game plan. Vikings are going to do the same thing here. So they better have some response for countering that and, and looking better offensively than they did last week. So I, I don't I, I would take plus three if you gave it to me on the Jets. Not going to play it at two and a half. I think the, the best strategy is a Mike McClure special way to live bet it and kind of see how the offense is responding and, and what they what they have planned to counteract that Minnesota blitz. And uh, if it looks promising, then I'm all over the Jets. And if it's the same old same from last week, then Minnesota by any margin probably. Yeah, no, that's a good point, too. And we've seen Aaron Rodgers. I mean, I think this technically, you know, Sunday morning, 930 a.m. does count as a primetime game. It's an island game, at least. I, I'm not saying – like Ro Rodgers is weird in these matchups where if it looks like the pressure is getting to him, if Minnesota is able to move the ball effectively – and you do think it might have to go through Aaron Jones or Ty Chandler coming out of the backfield just because of those cornerback matchups. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I think Justin Jefferson's probably matchup proof, but I mean, he, you know, this is a, a team that, that does have elite corners. And if they're, if they're scoring at will and they get a big lead and then start to run it, you know, and still sending pressure, Rogers isn't afraid to sort of pack up his, you know, put his, you know, pack up his toys and head home. I don't think he'll do that from London as desperate as this team is for a win. But uh, yeah, I mean, like if the Vikings look good early, maybe they do become a bit of a front runner. The another revenge game has to be to no Bryce Young for the revenge factor here. Panthers at Bears. It's a DJ Moore revenge game. Bears minus three and a half with a total of 41 here, Mike. I like the Bears side. I think the number is a little short here. I, I think it should be a minimum four and a half. A few models that I also respect to have it up over six. Uh, I, I just think that these teams are not that close. I think Chicago's got one of the best defenses in the NFL. Uh, and you look at Andy Dalton. Look, he's been fine. He's been great. Everything's been an upgrade from Bryce Young. Uh, but you have to consider the opponents still. I know Cincinnati, we'll talk about them in a minute, hasn't been great defensively, really, really poor defensively. Uh, and just a team that kind of plays to the level of the competition. They still want that game by 10 points and then you talk about the Raiders in that particular spot I, I don't think the Raiders are any good either uh, so I like the spot for Chicago I think the home field is very good for them here I think that their defense is going to be able to put enough pressure on Andy Dalton Deontay Johnson comes in with the questionable tag fully expect him to play uh, but wouldn't be shocked at all if he doesn't make it through the entire game against this defense so I like the Bears here I think Caleb Williams continues to take step forward uh, and it's really just the home field advantage, the defense. And ultimately, again, I think it should be at least to that key number of four uh, until there. I think you have to play the Bears. 
And it's been four a lot of the week, and it kind of bounces down to three and a half. I think there's some expectation that Carolina is offense. And remember, it's a revenge game for Andy Dalton, too. He did play for Chicago that one yeah. year. So um, right. he's going to have Sorry, a, a re- revenge game against a lot of people, against a lot of people, which is I know Will has all in his calendar all those revenge games that Andy Dalton has. on. Cavalry's coming up as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm fully prepared yeah. for these Andy Dalton revenge games. Now, the Chicago offense looks better than it has the first two weeks, but it's still not completely clicking. Um, they still continue to be an under team. Just three of their nine drives against an awful Rams defense went for 20-plus yards last week. Um, I, I expected better for them in that game in that matchup. You would expect better from them here. So so I agree that they should be scoring into the probably mid to high 20s here. But um, I need to see it to believe it with this offense because they just have not been able to to get it done, really. Um, but a lot of injuries on the Carolina defensive side, line, especially a yep. linebacker. Uh, Shaq Thompson, Josie Jewell, both hurt now. Um, it feels like this total, though, being as low as it is, is predicting a game where these teams struggle in the red zone, but 11 of 12 red zone drives against Carolina's defense have ended in touchdowns. So, like, anybody that gets to the red zone against Carolina is punching it in, basically, um, even though Chicago hasn't proven they can do that. So I think it's just too many points at four to lay with the Bears for me. At three and a half, I understand it's the sharp side. I'm still not looking to play it. I'm probably looking at the Panthers with rose color, color glasses more than anything. Um, I just haven't seen enough from that offense. I would be interested in this over, even though the market seems to be going against it. Just want to watch the wind forecast, make sure that's not a play here. But can't, Panthers are clear over team right now with Andy Dalton, the quarterback, and, and how that defense looks. I don't think any of their their total should be in that 40 range. Yeah, I, I'm with you completely. I would lean towards the over as well. I think it's four of 11 starters from the preseason depth chart on defense for the Panthers that are still there. And this team has been gutted by injuries, and they weren't going to be very good anyway after trading away Brian Burns. So you have a team in Carolina that really can't stop anyone. Um, you know, I think we'll learn more about the Bengals, and as Mike said, we'll talk about them in a minute. But, like, you know, this is a Bengals team that has now played the Commanders and the Panthers in back-to-back weeks, and – Maybe we're sort of treating it as, oh, since he's here, when in reality it could just be the commanders will give up points and the Panthers will hemorrhage points. Um, two props I like in this one, uh, DeAndre Swift over rushing yards. And you could, it, you know, I don't think it's out right now, but if you can find a rushing receiving yard total for him, maybe like that better. He had 120-plus uh, total yards last week and got 16 carries. So it seems like they're starting to sort of trend back to liking him after the slow start to the season. Um, and then DJ Moore. I think DJ Moore's reception receiving yards total is 53 and a half. The guy that traded him to the Bears, the guy's going to have a bigger game than that. Carolina can't stop anybody. Give me DJ Moore over 53 and a half uh, receiving yards as well in this one. I, 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 I'm surprised by the total too. It, as RJ said, watch the wind. That is absolutely a consideration in the event that, you know, Andy Dalton and Caleb Williams can't get it done in the passing game. We could see a ton of runs, ton of Chuba Hubbard, ton of DeAndre Swift and Roshan Johnson. The aforementioned multiple times, Bengals are playing the Ravens, or hosting the Ravens, I should say, this week as two-and-a-half-point dogs with a massive 49-and-a-half-point total here, RJ. Um, Look, Cincinnati playing better, but still in very much dire straits. Uh, in terms of what they need to do to stay in the playoff hunt. You like them, though, to keep it close enough from a teaser perspective. Yeah, clear teaser number at two and a half. It's it's a, one of these AFC North divisional games, uh, two teams that were predicted to be pretty even heading into the season. Um, you know, they, I think their uh, odds to win the division were pre- basically neck and neck all the, all the way down through August. Um, so love getting it through the key numbers, three and seven, up to eight and a half. I mean, if it was three, I you know, it just feels like you got to play the Bengals there um, and what should be a tight matchup. I know how great the, the Ravens look. They're now my number one team. In the in the power ratings tied for or tied for first with San Francisco, and I still would make this line, you know, one, one and a half. So um Buffalo looked like the best team in the league until they played Baltimore, who now looks like the best team in the league, despite a two and two record. Um since he looks like they're back on track now, the offense is getting going, T Huggin, T Higgins getting healthy. Um Baltimore's been roughly league average defensively. I don't know if since he's offense can keep up with Baltimore's offense if since he's defense can't get stops, and maybe they can't. We have to kind of wait to see what the injury report says. Does look early in the week like it's uh, it's po- trending positive. Hendrickson limited practice, BJ Hill limited practice. I don't think Sheldon Rankin was, was out there yet. Um, if if they get a healthier um, defensive line and they're able to slow down Derrick Henry some, I could see this being a close game. So uh, I'm going to take the three if I get it at, at any point, but uh, it's definitely my first teaser like here for Cincy plus eight and a half. Yeah, and looking at this game here, you know, the Cincinnati Bengals, they honestly aren't far off from being a 4-0 team. I know that they had disappointing results. They lost to the game in Kansas City by one. Uh, very easily could have won that game. 
you you look at the way the Patriots game went. They had many opportunities, uncharacteristic mistakes, and just Ramondre Stevenson did Ramondre Stevenson things that really put the game away, right? But this team, they're right there with the commanders. Yes, they gave up a lot of points. They have question marks defensively. But when I look at them, their style of play, they're just a team that we, we see it a lot in basketball, honestly, guys, is there are certain teams that just play to the competition, no matter what the competition is. They just play to the competition. And that's what I think the Cincinnati Bengals team is from the coaching staff to Joe Burrow to just the way this team plays. So I expect this game to be extremely competitive. Uh, both of these teams basically could be 4-0 teams at this point in the season. Uh, I think they're very good offensively. We'll see. The question mark for me is definitely the defensive side of the ball. If Derrick Henry is going to be able to have success, good luck beating Baltimore. Because when Derrick Henry has success, if you've watched every Ravens game this year, there have been multiple plays, one every game for sure, but I believe multiple where the defense doesn't know who has the ball. The camera crew doesn't know who has the ball because of how much attention is going to Derrick Henry and how good Lamar is on some of those reads. And that's what happens when Derrick Henry is having success. So it, to me, it all comes down to what can the Cincy run defense do? If they're not able to stop, they're not going to win this game. They might still cash a teaser leg for you, but they're not going to win the game. They're not going to be able to play from in front at all. Uh, so I'm not playing anything here. I want to speculate on Lamar's running. I want to speculate on Zay Flowers, who had a very poor game from a, a passing standpoint last time. I think he's heavily involved here because I do think that since he will figure out a way to make Lamar throw. Uh, so I, I'm looking at Zay Flowers props, playing him in DFS a bit, but I, I'm out on the side in total here because I, I'm pretty much right in line with it. Uh, just to follow up, because I, I sort of wonder with the turtle here, RJ, if Derrick Henry can run well, do you think that just induces Cincy to Cincy to throw uh, just an absolute ton and we could see it shoot over? Yeah, um, I mean, they should be throwing a ton anyway with the personnel they got with Jamar Chase T. Higgins. Um, so I don't know why you wouldn't throw well. Um, you also get the emergence of Eric All, um, a tight end, a young, <laughs> young tight end that they drafted that a lot of people were high on, that the, the fantasy dynasty leaguers were high on. He looks like he's emerging. He had, um, I believe, more, the most snaps of the tight end group for the first time last week. Certainly had a much better game than Mike Gusecki's one, ca one catch for negative nine yards. Thanks for that. Picked him up and to start him uh, with Trey McBride hurt, and <laughs> that did not help at all. Um, so I think Eric All emerging. You might be able to find some cheap Eric All props in the market here, um, as, as it's not probably not capturing the fact that he's emerging in the offense. All right. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, a, a scorcher of an AFC East battle between the Dolphins and the Patriots. Next. You want to talk about low turtles, talk about the uh, Snoop Huntley-led Miami Dolphins. I mean – the quarterback's a problem, but there's a lot of issues going on in Miami. Uh, at the same time, they're still just one-point dogs at New England. Or maybe that says everything you need to know about the Dolphins, that they are a one-point dog in New England to a Patriots team that just you know, had that week one showing and looked frisky early on, but clearly is lacking in talent, especially at the skill positions. Uh, the possibility of Ramondre Stevenson being – bench for Antonio Gibson here, which is tough considering they gave him an extension in the offseason. Uh, Patriots fans wondering where the hell Drake May is um, and any sort of changes they make. You know, it's, it, it feels like the later you get, the more likely we are to see Drake May. But man, Mike, uh, tough to love anything here. Patriots minus one with a total of 36 and a half. Yeah, I'm going to say if you're a long-term Patriots fan, I'm not sure you want Drake May out there uh, taking hits in this situation. But uh, yeah, this game is absolutely ugly. I I've looked ahead and I know where RJ's going here. That's the only real direction I can lean. Uh, I, I just think points are going to be at a premium. I, I You look at Miami, I've been very unimpressed with their game plan. I know the situation is, is bad for them. I know it's unfortunate, but man. They still got a number of skill position players. They they can't seem to figure out ways to get them the football uh, and really haven't seen much that's going to change. I think that if anything, we just see more designed runs uh, for, for Tyler Huntley here, especially in the red zone. So I'm uh, I'm out on this game. I have no interest in watching it. I have no interest in betting it. Uh, <laughs> if I had to bet it, uh, I would turn the floor over to RJ and, and just tail that play. 
Yeah, I'm not sure there are going to be, um, you know, Tyler Huntley red zone carries. I'm not sure Miami's going to be in the red zone. I mean, they're just, their offense looks very bad. And um, brutal injuries on both sides. David Andrews lost for the year. That's that's major. I wanted to like the Patriots, but I don't know how that, that offensive line is going to respond without their leader in the middle of that line. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, Jalen Phillips is done. I mean, no pass, that that's the pass rush for Miami gone. Um, so yeah. then maybe Jacoby Brissett just is able to have a nice little game here, um, being able to stretch that Miami back back uh, secondary and, and, and the linebackers because they don't have to worry about the passers as much um so new england's looked terrible the last two weeks but that at the jets and at the 49ers that's a very tough stretch of two weeks um for any team much less one of the, the worst teams in the league they were competitive in the first two weeks not just beating the Bengals, but taking the the seahawks to overtime miami's offense looks like it can't function without Tua. losing 31 to 12 at home to tennessee in prime time is embarrassing um their defense did only allow one drive of 30 plus yards but that's just because tennessee was always starting close enough to the, to the red zone to get 29, 28, 29 yards and kick field goals. Um, so I don't think my, Miami's going to get blown out for a four straight game, but it feels like their season's over likely more fight on New England side. I could not take the under on a 36 and a half total in the game, but I had no problem looking at the team totals and taking Miami's under 17 and a half. So that's my, my best bet in this game is taking the dolphins under 17 and a half points. Yeah. I mean, things are, things are so bad. You know, Tyreek Hill is trolling people on Twitter about possibly being traded and, Everyone's suggesting send him back to Kansas City and all all those sort of things. I mean, it, I think you know one of the things about this game when you look at Mike McDaniel, and I don't think Mike McDaniel's on the hot seat in Miami just because you lose your quarterback who you signed to a big extension in the off season, and it would be tough to you know t- it would be tough to be like all right you're out because of this. At the same time, the offensive you know it's like. I don't know, man. We we see, you know, like Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield are playing. Like there are quarterbacks out there that you could have gotten, like like guys who were you know back, like valid backups who are playing well. It feels like there's a lot more missing parts to this Miami team. I think that's a pretty good look. Commanders and the Browns. I mean, just a when you picture a uniform matchup in your mind, Cleveland going to Washington and these it's just it's just gross. It feels very fall. It feels very like late fallish. And uh, and the total reflects it. Forty three and a half. The Commanders minus three and a half. I'm taking the over in this one. I'm surprised the total is this low. Ball. I mean, uh, Cleveland. Excuse me. Is willing to play at like a pretty high rate in terms of like neutral pass rate. And then you also have the Commanders defense that I don't think can stop very many people. Now maybe they can sh- stop Deshaun Watson. They slowed down the Cardinals last week, but. I think we see the, the Browns' defense a little unable to slow down Jaden Daniels. The you know if Cliff Kingsbury keeps uh, taking a more vertical approach to this air raid, this offense is is legitimate. And the Washington def- offensive line is run blocking well and pass blocking well. The weapons are stepping up for Jaden Daniels. This looks like a really good team on offense. And on the other side, I just don't think they'll be able to slow down Cleveland enough. I think we end up getting closer to the 50s here, uh, and I think 43 and a half is uh, too low, Mike. Yeah, I definitely think there could be points. Uh, you know, this one is is interesting. It's not fun, but I, I do lean towards the Browns side, believe it or not, at three and a half. Mm. Uh, I, I'm big, big Washington fan, big fan of Jaden Daniels. Uh, do I think what he's doing right now is completely sustainable? Probably not. Uh, now the defense is a real question mark, right? Because the defense is not great. We all know the defense isn't great, but what happens in situations like this, when the team isn't supposed to be great and the offense is humming, the defense magically gets better, whether it's more effort, whatever it is, the defense in some situations does start to play better. And if they win this game and keep winning, I wouldn't be surprised to see the defense continue to get better and better as the year goes on. Uh, But right now, I think if there was a letdown spot for the Washington commanders, I think it would be this one only because I think this is a good matchup for the Browns to really be competitive and put some points on the board. I think Amari Cooper is going to get loose against the secondary. If Deshaun Watson can get him the ball. Remember last week, there was a long touchdown pass to Cooper that didn't count called back. Right. Uh, I think we'd be thinking about this Browns team a little bit differently, you know, with a lot more optimism, had that play stand. Uh, so I actually like this spot for the Browns at three and a half. Uh, I think the number could probably be two and a half, which is still a big difference uh, between these two teams. Between the numbers. Yeah. I'm not surprised you're leaning that way. That's definitely the sharp side. A lot of, a lot of people have been looking at this and saying, I got to get this three and a half. And that's why it's dropped to three in some places. I have a best bet on the Browns at plus three and a half. Um, you know, I think that the difference there, I would be looking at Cleveland a lot better if they just got healthy on the offensive line. They, rather than the tackles getting healthy, they keep on losing interior linemen. Now Ethan Pochich is hurt. Um, and you know, you get 
uh, DNPs from the, the leading two tacklers on Wednesday. You get limited practices from the other two tackles. Um, I think they can go out and score points on Washington. I just need them to be healthy up front because they haven't been able to score points on anyone, um, even this beat up uh, Raiders team, you know. Um, so Washington's D, you know, 6.2 yards per play allowed, last in percentage of drives ending in a score. Um, you can score on them, obviously. Uh, Washington's offense, I agree, has to regress. I mean, no quarterback has ever had 85% completion rate in two back-to-back -back games. You just can't keep doing that. Um, and he's been incredible through four weeks. But once he starts to take a little step back in Washington scoring 20 points instead of 30, 35 points, you know, you're know, you leaving the door open for the defense to give up these games. So this line has addressed, adjusted significantly from the last few weeks and from preseason expectations where Cleveland would have been favored in this game. Um, and Washington's never had great home field advantage. So you, you, you're not even accounting for like a three point home field or a two and a half point home field. Um, the, this line right now is saying Washington's significantly better than Cleveland. Um, I think over the course of a season, that's probably not correct. So the value has to be with the dog. So best bet on the Browns for me. Non-zero chance you get a little Javis Winston too. If like Deshaun just completely stinks, like we're getting to that point, right? I mean, where it, I mean, or he gets hurt, and if that happens, it set the total at 50, 59 and a half because Deshaun and Javis, Javis against Jaden is going to be a shootout. All right, we've got the Bills at the Texans. Texas Tex, Bills are minus one here as a, a short road favorite with a total of forty-seven and a half. Um, this is very clearly RJ, the Stefan Diggs revenge game, his second second of the uh, second of the year, and he got plenty of targets in his first one. I believe twelve targets, ten catches against the Vikings, his original team, and now gets to go up against the team that traded him to the Texans this off season. Uh, you're not looking in the revenge direction, though, are you? No, maybe he'll get a chance to throw a touchdown again and then just pull it down and run in for a touchdown himself, which is what he did last week. You know, I, I was like, oh, look at this play design. And he's like, no, nah, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to just score touchdowns. I don't want to throw touchdowns. Um, I like the under here. Houston hasn't played up to their potential despite three and one record while Buffalo is coming off that beat down uh, against the Ravens matched up poorly there. Um, I, I had it, Bill's optimism for one week and look what it got me, you know, so now I'm going to treat this team a little bit differently moving forward. I don't think Houston's offense is equipped to take advantage of the bad Buffalo run defense with their running back injuries. Houston's defense is strong against the pass and Buffalo's run game has been kind of mad. I know they lean on it the last, you know, first few weeks of the season, but just not, not very efficient at all. Um, it's a massive game for playoff considerations. So I expect conservative play from the two defensive head coaches here, which is why I like the under here. Buffalo could also get a defensive boost. Uh, Terrell Bernard might be able to healthy for this game. He was limited on Wednesday. Uh, Teron Johnson might be, might be available for this game. He was limited. Wednesday. Those would be two big massive upgrades. Uh, they really missed those guys against the Ravens. Um, and then you look on the offensive side, Laramie Tunsil and Deion Dawkins both did not practice on Wednesday. Both, and I don't know that both either was veteran rest days. I think both are legitimately dealing with some injuries that they had to play through last week. You, you lose one of those guys. I think the the offensive ceiling for these this game comes down considerably because the pass rush is going to start getting home. So I like getting in on the 47 and a half now ahead of potential injury news on Friday that could drop this total. Yeah, I'm mostly in the same boat there. Uh, I'm not interested in picking the winner on the side here. I think that this is appropriately priced. Uh, you know, I, I think the question is, is for Buffalo, can you tackle Nico Collins after the catch? Uh, he, he's a big bodied receiver. I think Buffalo's maybe a little undersized in certain positions there. So that's my big concern if you're Buffalo. Uh, as far as the total, though, I, I do lean that way. I also lean 23 and a half under in the first half as well, especially shop around. If for some reason you're still finding 24 or 24 and a half, I, I would definitely be under that number in the first half. You know, we've talked about Buffalo and seen them at times this year, uh, really be able to score pretty quickly and be very efficient. I think they're going to have some success moving the ball between the twenties, but I do think those drives are going to take a little longer in this particular matchup. So I, I do think that we see clock moving uh, potentially, as RJ said, more conservative approach, potentially settling for a field goal uh, or a field goal attempt in some of those situations is, is very likely, particularly early in this game. So I do lean under um, as far as who wins it. I Man, it's tough to call and it's an extremely important game uh, with playoff implications here in week five. Sure is. Speaking of important games, let's get to Doug Peterson's last stand. Colts at Jaguars. Jaguars are minus two and a half here, the total of 46. I mean, I'm going to do so. I mean, I'm going to take the Jaguars here. 
I'm probably going to regret it because Jacksonville has looked pretty bad so far this season. Uh, Gus Bradley revenge game, by the way. Uh, but I do think, you know, you could see some explosive plays here. Like, I don't know. Doug Peterson can't come out and say, I haven't lost the locker room yet, yet this week. Like, when you have to say, I haven't lost the locker room, you know what? You've lost the locker room. And it feels like as the more and more that Belichick is out there, the more and more that this team struggles – you know, you, we saw it with Frank Wright in uh, in Carolina and Indy late in his run there. And it's maybe like the, is the game passed on Peterson by? I think a lot of people are wondering that. Trevor Lawrence has been extremely inaccurate on, on certain passes, but it's also not entirely like certain that this offense is, is right for what he needs to be. I do think they have sort of a everybody's petrified that people are getting fired and they come out and play really well offensively. I think this sets up for a Brian Thomas Jr. explosion game. I think he finds the end zone at least once uh, in this matchup, and we see some points from the Jaguars and maybe an inspired defensive performance. Um, you know, you're likely getting Joe Flacco and Trey Sermon here for the Colts, and you're getting the Jaguars at a pretty minimal price, RJ. Well, Richardson did, was limited in practice on Wednesday, so I don't know about likely Flacco. You might you might get Richardson in this game. Um, You're going to hobble offensive. Richardson, then hobble Richardson and Trey Sermon. A few offensive linemen for the Colts also missed practice. We'll see how healthy they are come Friday. Um, you know, it seems like everybody wants to pile on the Jaguars here at 0-4. Um, you know, they they need this win, obviously. They're probably out of the playoffs anyway, but, you know, with that division, who knows? Um, everyone loves them this week. It feels like they're overvalued to me. It feels like the number already has all that baked in. I would have liked the Jaguars, too, if we were getting something around a pick them, you know, this, where you would figure an 0-4 team would be in this type of spot. But uh, that we're not, that's not the number we're getting. We're getting three in some spots. And in three, I would probably lean to Indy if the injuries aren't awful once you get to Friday. Jacksonville's numbers are awful across the board, but they don't feel too far from three and one, right? They had that ETN fumble in week one. They outplayed Cleveland in week two. They had the last minute loss in week four where they, they could have won that game. Um, but with the locker room being bad, I don't want any part of Jacksonville right now. I kind of need to see them win before I'm willing to take them at this point. Yep, right in there with you. I think that they're very close to being a three and one team, but the problem is, is they they aren't a three and one team. They they've made the mistakes at the end. Some of it has been coaching, some of it's been execution, some of it's just been simply in game variance. But throughout that process, I, I think it's very clear that Trevor Lawrence has no confidence. Uh, you watch him play; yeah. he, he's lost the confidence, and that's to me is more concerning than the locker room being lost for Doug Peterson. I think it's when your quarterback is in that situation. Yes, he got paid. Yes. All all that, uh, the confidence is just not there. And this is the must win game. Like if they win this game, can they regain the confidence for Trevor Lawrence? Can they be okay? Yeah. If they win this game, they could make the playoffs still. It's a division win. They get two games in a row overseas where they're comfortable, where they do actually have an advantage. Uh, it, it's possible. They could string together three wins, but they have a tough schedule after that remaining. So I, I think that it's likely a scenario that they don't win. Doug Peterson might get left in uh, in London after that that second game over there, uh, and and things might start over. Because when you look at the ownership group of this team, they had very high expectations. They've been very vocal, which. Frankly, if you're a fan, it's something you should want. You want an owner that really cares and wants to invest and wants to win. Uh, but when you have all of those things and it goes poorly like this, it's embarrassing, right? And I think they're going to make changes. So this is an absolute must-win game. I understand the interest and in everyone piling on the Jags. I lean to the Jags here still as well. Uh, but I, I need to see it because I don't think the quarterback is in the right headspace right now. And I, I think that's a big, big problem. Yeah, I mean, the one thing you have going for you if you're Jacksonville is that with Trevor Lawrence there, and I still believe in Trevor Lawrence, and I mean, I, I think it's I think it's way too early to you know call call the dogs off in his career. There's going to be plenty of interest this offseason from other possible coaches. Okay, Raiders at Broncos. Speaking of turmoil in the locker room, Raiders got plenty of that. We will tell you about that game and our best bets for that game coming up next after the break. CBS Sports HQ, giving you college football coverage unlike anyone else. We're talking Big Ten pre- and post-game coverage. Are you encouraged with the way that this team responded? Along with breaking news. A lot of movement in the rankings this week. Highlights and expert analysis. That streak could be in jeopardy here. Sure. What was your main takeaway from this game? How impressive was his domination? Oh, that really changed the football game. Let's go ahead and have some more fun. Another wild ending. The chaos <laughs> continues. Turn to CBS Sports HQ. I don't know. I mean, I, the Broncos don't really feel like a two and two team. And yet here we are. Um, yeah. The, whatever the hell you call that win against uh, the Jets last week, where I mean, to 10 to nine, just in 
60 passing yards and you win a football game in 2024. Just wild, wild stuff. But they are two and two, and they are three point favorites at home against the Raiders with a total of 36. You've got another team total under you're looking at here, RJ. Yeah. Do you think the Raiders feel like a two and two team? I mean, they're two and two also. They, they, <laughs> they sure don't. <laughs> they, don't, they don't have anything near the defense that the Broncos do on either side of the ball. You know, Broncos at least have one of the best defenses in the league, which they, I know it was weather aided, but they've kind of proved that last week. Um, you know, if it was still two and a half, I, I would think about laying it with Denver. I do like Denver in that side, even though it's both laying points with Bo Nix, which feels awful, but this elite defense is facing a bad offense at home. I don't see Vegas scoring much in this game. So my, my best bet here is Vegas. Team total under 16 and a half points. I don't know how they get to 17. They have key injuries on both sides of the ball. Uh, Denver's going to be able to lean on the run game and not put too much on Knicks. I think you'll get limited possessions in this game with Denver running it down the field and then the defense just stopping whatever Vegas has. It's such a t- low, low total, though, that once it gets to three, it's tough for me to lay that three uh, with a bad quarterback. But if it's two and a half, I like Denver. Um, but team total here, I don't see how Vegas gets to 17 without some horrendous Bo and Knicks pass that gets intercepted and returned for a touch, easy touchdown. Yeah, I, I'm not playing anything here. At two and a half, it's definitely a comfortable lean. Uh, you know, you could still find money line under minus 150, like right at minus 140 uh, in a few spots. That's where I would look with Denver. I, I know it's not always comfortable laying minus 140 on Bo Nix and company, but if there were a matchup to do it in division, uh, it's this one on your home field. You know, you talk about teams potentially losing the locker room. I know that a lot of it is a few individual players on the Raiders side, but if the things aren't having success at all, I think that team's going to lose the locker room room uh, across the board relatively quickly here. So uh, I do think that the Broncos are definitely the better team. They've got the better defense. Uh, And this is a spot where, frankly, I think Sean Payton is a master with young quarterback like this uh, and really playing to his quarterback strengths, playing to his team's strengths overall. And that's where the advantage is. It's just simply getting the win. I trust Denver to do that with Sean Payton and the, you know, the competition that they're facing on the other side. Now, can Brock Bowers be a magician and make some crazy plays, extend a drive and put them in a good position? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Uh, But I ultimately think this card, the cards are against the Raiders in a big way here. Uh, So give me the Broncos on the money line, minus 140. Yeah, I'm with you. Just as a quick aside, uh, Devontae Adams out with a hamstring. It's, there were some rumors that it was kind of based on him not being happy there. Uh, then there was a report from, I think, Diana Rossini of The Athletic that it was actually, you know, he's actually, a, it's a hamstring injury. He's going to be out one to two weeks, uh, but it does feel like he's being traded at this point. Do we, uh, any any thoughts other than the Jets, Mike? I mean, I know he's, it's been floated that he wants the Jets or the Saints, which like, dude, just quit with the Derek Carr thing already. Like, do you really, you're really, you're really, that's what you want to do? I mean, like, I, again, you get it, you went to college with the guy, but you already tried it once. It didn't work out. I understand the Roger stuff, maybe. Um, I don't know. It feels like there's better fits for him uh, other than the Jets or, or Saints, but he's hell-bent on going to one of those. I uh, will say if the Royals beat the Yankees in a couple weeks, I'm letting you know now I will have a hamstring injury uh, coming up there. So that, that's how I feel about the hamstring injury uh, for Devontae. I, I don't think it's a massive deal. I think any wide receiver in the NFL, especially if you're over the age of 25, you can list yourself with a hamstring injury. You've got some sort of limited hamstring at some point throughout the entire season. So I don't think that's a big deal. As far as where he goes, I mean, yeah, I think the preferred destination uh, for him is the Jets. I think it could happen with the Saints and Carr, but it really comes down to asking price and what he's worth. And if the asking price is truly a second round pick, uh, I, I don't know who's valuing him at this stage in his career as a second round pick, unless you're just absolutely all in chips on the table. Let's go win a Super Bowl right now. And let's be honest. I don't think the Jets or the Saints are in either one of those teams are in that position. I know the Jets want to be with Aaron Rodgers at this point in his career, but I haven't seen enough despite having overs on them and a lot of interest in the futures market. I still haven't seen enough. The team that would be in that spot would be Kansas City. I don't think they can make it work with the cap, but we've seen creative things happen before. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see where it goes. But if it's a second round pick, uh, I, I think that's crazy unless you're one of the top four teams. Yeah, I think if you're the the Raiders, um, having to eat money to get him to trade it to Kansas City, which you don't want to do anyway, 
is kind of a tough pill to swallow. The team that, that nobody's talking about that I think would be interesting is Washington. Um, there's still a team mm. that, that is behind the eight ball in terms of receivers. Terry McLaurin, great. Um, they traded away Jahan Dotson. Um, you've got this young quarterback locked into a deal for four years plus the, the option. Um, this, this is the stage where you go and get those veteran receivers to put around him. And with the excitement on that team, if the defense isn't going to carry its weight and Jaden Daniels is going to complete 90% of his passes, you might want to have a Devontae Adams WR1 in there to, to go to. So that offense gets even more dangerous if you go out and make that type of move. So that would be like the sneaky team that nobody's talking about that could, that could talk themselves into, look, we're three and one, we're leading the division. If we want to make this thing work and you're one of Jaden Daniels, let's go get Devontae Adams. I, I, with you, I like Washington as the sleeper. I know like, I mean, even Baltimore feels a little crazy. Like Baltimore and Buffalo have been thrown out like as, as sort of sleeper options as well. But I think Washington makes a ton of sense, especially if, you know, that offensive line is going to play the way it's played the first month of the season. I mean, dude, like Philly's a little down. Dallas is down. The Giants aren't it right now. Go get Devontae Adams. Make Terry McLaurin a wide receiver too. You know, put Noah Brown in that third wide receiver role, and you're kind of cooking with gas on offense, I think, uh, very quickly. The Arizona Cardinals headed to the San Francisco 49ers. Arizona has looked – I think Arizona is, like, to me, on the right trajectory for whatever they're trying to do under the new coaching staff, um, even if it's not always translating into – you know, like, it feels like they're building out the team in, in kind of the right way. And the 49ers are missing a ton of pieces. Christian McCaffrey now has Achilles tendonitis in both of his legs. Um, if, we're, if, we're, if we're charting this trajectory – like, if we're charting this – in terms of like, you know, what we're going to get next week from Christian McCaffrey, he's not going to have legs based on how this thing has gone from the start of the season to now. Uh, but if Niners still seven and a half point favorites here, RJ, with a total of 49 and a half in expectation. By the way, Brock Purdy played some pretty good football. Purdy's looked incredible. I know he, he his numbers on on low efficiency were or you know low amount of attempts were were very good in the past, and now he's thrown a lot more attempts, and they're still very good. So credit to him. Um, I took this uh, as a teaser leg. It's kind of, it's coming down to seven in some spots. At seven, I'm definitely looking to play the 49ers here, even with Trey McBride bat that back. They got healthy in a hurry on offense. And they're going to score a ton of points in this game. Um, I like pairing them with Cincinnati to tease them down to one and a half as my pick for this game. Um, backing of favorites of a touchdown or more has been awful this year. Um, San Francisco did get the cover in that situation last week. Um, and Arizona's offense has been hit or miss. Impressive the first two weeks, but scored 13 and 14 the last two weeks against beatable defenses, and their defense is as bad as expected. So I'm not sure how San Francisco scores less than 30 in this game, and I'm not confident Arizona's offense, which has had its its issues these last few weeks, can get a backdoor cover on the number if it's seven. The one thing I am worried about is San Francisco does play Thursday, so it's a little bit of a look-ahead spot for them with Seattle on deck. Um, and then Fred Warner was did not practice on Wednesday. If they if they hold mm. him out, you know you just can't lay the full seven and a half at all. And then I start to have questions about seven. But if he doesn't play, I still like them to cover by at least one and a half. So throwing that in a teaser with Cincinnati. Yep, I think it's teaser leg candidate. I would be weary of laying the seven seven and a half. Um, just look, especially if Warner's out. I, I think these games could get competitive in division. And they are looking ahead. And the goal for San Francisco right now is simply stay healthy, right? Win games, stay healthy. That's the only goal that this team should have. And I think that that's kind of evident by the game plan we saw at the end against the Patriots. And I think we see something similar here. Uh, I'll be using them in, you know, one of the survivors uh, that I have left as well. But I'm not laying a big number with them. I, I think that it's entirely possible they win this game 30 to 7. But I don't have a lot of confidence in laying any sort of more than a touchdown here because Kyler Murray, when he's got his weapons, is the ultimate garbage time hero uh, that can really make a game a lot closer than it needs to be or should be. So I'm mostly off of this. If I had to play it, it would be a teaser leg like RJ is electing to play here. I feel pretty good about 49ers advancing and moving on. Uh, offensively, I think they're relatively healthy at this point. I know they're missing, missing Christian McCaffrey, but when you have Trent Williams in there, you've got George Kittle, you've got Debo Samuel, Jordan Mason can be 90% of what Christian McCaffrey is. And it's mm. because it's a product of the system. It's why we don't value running backs too much against, uh, you know, on a point spread anyway. Uh, so Mason is more than capable here. We saw last week touching the football, I believe 27, 28 times total. Uh, between the run game and the passing game, I think it's more than capable of that. So if you're Christian McCaffrey and the 49ers, uh, I I wouldn't try to bring him back b before, you know, divisional round in the playoffs, right? Like there's no real benefit. There's no upside in bringing him back before then. 
uh, th there's only downside in my opinion, because this team doesn't need home field advantage. They don't need any of those things. They need to have a good enough record to get in, whether it's wild card or not. Uh, and I think they're going to be fine if they do that. So I like where they're at offensively here. It's just stay healthy and move on. Yeah. And uh, if you told me Fred Warner's not going to play in this game, I think I would like the over. I know it's a high total, but Brock Purdy and, and that offense will be able to do what they want. And coming back the other way with no Warner, who's really, I mean, probably the leader right now for defensive player of the year with the way that he's played. Um, I think you could see Arizona score pretty easily. Uh, I would I would also add too, to your point about McCaffrey and Mason. Like Jordan Mason has been closing at minus 180 to score a touchdown every week for the last couple of weeks. That is a crazy number for an undrafted free agent, like at any point in the season on any team. And that just speaks to what Kyle Shanahan, what this offense can do. The Green Bay Packers nearly engineered a crazy comeback against the Vikings last week, fell just short, losing by two. I'm sure that wasn't a problem for anybody out there at all. There are three point favorites on the road. Speaking of injuries, man, the Rams just absolutely devastated. Matthew Stafford still playing some really, really good football here, though, RJ. And yet it feels like this is a major uphill battle because even when the Packers lose somebody like Christian Watson, who's not expected to go on IR, they have a guy like Dontavian Wicks to fill right in. Jaden Reeds looks incredible. Um, Josh Jacobs running the ball well. And the, the Packers are just a good football team, especially with Jordan Love now a week healthier. Yeah, a, lo a lot of options there for them. I mean, uh, the guy who might be filling in for him because he didn't have a high uh, volume role was Bo Melton. Like, go go bet your Bo Melton anytime touchdown uh, props yeah. in this game because um, yeah. they, they uh, you know on the on indoors at SoFi Stadium. I mean, they just score a ton of points here against the worst defense in the league. I don't know how the Rams can keep up with the state of their receiver core. Still not going to have their top two receivers. Still looking at two two at Wells or number one Jordan Whittington. Demarcus Robinson hasn't gotten a, a ton of looks, but. You know, it's, it's just tough for Stafford. I mean, he could light up the scoreboard. We've seen him in the past do it. Um, so, you know, and it, now that it's down to minus three and the market has taken some Rams money, I think the Packers are a best bet at minus three. I, want, I only want to lay the three, really, if I'm back in Green Bay. But I think the number should be higher. I think it should be five, five and a half, six even, um, because that Rams offense, I just don't see how they keep up with the 30-plus I see Green Bay scoring in this game. Now, Green Bay's defense hasn't been impressive to me. Um, we saw what happened early in that Minnesota game. A couple of them were short drives, but – but I, I, they haven't really been that impressive. I think um, they've been just getting three turnovers every game, and that's been helping them out. Not going to get to do that every game, um, so you're going to have to start getting more stops. Maybe that happens here, but they're also banged up defensively. Um, you know, I, I believe guys like um, uh, – uh, the you know on the defensive line and they probably have three or four guys in the front seven. Jair Alexander's not hadn't practiced to start the week. Need some of those guys in there. Or Stafford might be able to light you up and make this a very high scoring game. So definitely looking at the over, looking at the over for for the Packers. But best bet here is going to be a minus three now that it's the, just a field goal. Yep, uh, Packers for me. I, I made the number up to five as well. I, I think that out of all the teams you talk about bye weeks, Rams absolutely limping into that bye next week. That they cannot come soon enough. Uh, when you talk about the state of the offense, the defense though has been bad. I think they're the worst defense in the NFL right now. Uh, worse than the commanders, right? Even with them in terms of EPA per play defensively. Uh, but that was because Washington was bad in weeks one and two. It's really turned around a bit since then. While the Rams, they're not going the right direction at all. Uh, and you look at their schedule and everything. Yes, they played tough schedule on paper with the 49ers, a game that they won, uh, and then the Lions. But I think this is just a tough spot for them. I think Green Bay is going to be good. I think that Green Bay probably could have beat Minnesota uh, last week. You know, it was a slow start with the interceptions early for Jordan Love, but they really, really turned it on. So offensively, I think Green Bay is going to have their way. And I think this is, you know, it's going to take a spectacular performance from Kyron Williams. He's going to have to bust, you know, we know his volume is there. We know he's a threat in the red zone, but he's going to have to have a 50, 60 yard play that potentially goes for a touchdown here uh, to really keep them in the game. I think they're going to struggle. So give me Green Bay here, minus three. Uh, don't agree with the market at all on this. It should be minimum of four and a half should be the number here. I would imagine this would be a pretty popular pick for DFS too, as well. Just the, yep. the possibility of big plays scoring. You mentioned Jordan Whittington, Bo Melton guys who you can get for cheap. Um, my best ball bags are perfectly fine with both of them exploding <laughs> in, in, in this spot. All right. Giants at Seahawks. Seahawks minus six and a half, total of 43 and a half. Uh, Brian Dable said on Thursday that they're going to take it as far as they can with Malik Neighbors, who suffered a concussion at the end of that Thursday night game last week. Said 10 days to get, you know, 
try and get back in total. Um, you know, I don't think we'll know until Sunday, probably, when it comes to neighbors. I, I sort of lean, uh, Mike, in, in the direction that we won't see him out there. And, man, does that make it tough to back the Giants? I know Wando Robinson is – getting volume, but like you take neighbors out of this offense. And Devin Singletary, I don't believe, practiced on Thursday either. So suddenly just a Giants team that is really, really banged up. Seattle, you would think, gets some of its defensive pieces, pieces back in this game after after missing them uh, on uh, earlier earlier this week. And, you know, it, it, it man, I mean, Seattle just feels like a healthier, better team right now. You're putting them in a teaser leg, right? Yes. Teaser leg with the Seahawks. Uh, going to play him in survivor as well. Look, I, I think this number should be seven and a half. Honestly, I, I know that Seattle may not be a great team. They honestly look pretty good offensively against Detroit. Uh, I was a little surprised with how well they were able to hang in there uh, offensively in that game. And, and it really, Kenneth Walker looked great, but Gino has been phenomenal in those receivers. Uh, when you've got DK Metcalf, he is difficult to contain. And, and when I look at this Giants defense, I think they're going to struggle with him there. I think they're going to struggle overall with all the pass rush. So for me, I think the key difference here for the Giants and a team like this, you know, comparing what Detroit was able to do to Seattle, Detroit actually has a quarterback that can deliver the football. I don't think Daniel Jones can consistently deliver the football to one of those open receivers there. I know Malik Neighbors has been phenomenal, uh, and he still will be phenomenal if he's on the field, but I don't think that he can hit the other receivers enough. So I really think this thing should be seven and a half. When it's not six and a half, I don't care about rules on teasers. I will still play it in a teaser leg here uh, because I do firmly believe we should be seeing seven, seven and a half. Uh, as far as neighbors, I personally think he will not play in this game. Uh, and Singletary wouldn't shock me if he's out as well. The market doesn't think he'll play either. There's a report that he, he seemed like a long shot to play and that moved this line from six to six and a half everywhere. Um, and, and it's interesting. I mean, you see Seattle was around a four point favorite two weeks ago against a Miami team with Skyler mm. Thompson at quarterback. And that tells you how bad the Giants offense is without neighbors that, that uh, Mike's talking about them as an eight point dog here um, twice as much as the, the Dolphins with that Skylar Thompson um, substitution in there. Defensive injuries are Seattle on full display against on Monday against Goff, completing every pass. The Wednesday practice report is trending a lot better. The only three guys did not practice. Now they're all on defense. Uh, Tyrell Dotson at linebacker, Boy Mafia at linebacker, and then Byron Murphy, the talented first round pick. But everyone else got in at least a limited practice, which means you could see Leonard Williams in there. You could see Uchenna Nwosu back in there. Um, Jerome Baker is, is practicing. So you get those guys in suddenly against an offense that doesn't have Malik neighbors. I mean, that could, that, this game could finish anywhere. Um, so my lean would probably be to Seattle at minus six and a half, but still a lot of points to lay with the Seahawks team um but they can cover even if they only get around 20 you know points if if neighbors is out so uh, again bad look ahead spot though san francisco is up next it's a massive game seahawks are supposed to come in and win this game so it could be one of those classic sleep blocking spots where they win 16 to 14 or they lose 14 to 13 or some stupid thing like that all right we got a couple of primetime games to hit plus rj's week six look ahead let's take a break when we come back we'll tell you about a Cowboys steelers scorcher of a matchup next it's a team almost too good to be true you guys ain't ready for us kick your game day off right as the top team tackles all the biggest headlines around the league who's got two thumbs and loves this next segment sunday mornings on cbs sports network Sunday night is a game your grandfather would love. Cowboys at Steelers. I mean, just the halcyon days of American football when men were men and we smoked cigs at halftime and whatnot. Uh, instead, we've got Justin Fields against like a white hot seat Mike McCarthy. Steelers uh, minus two and a half here with a total of 44. Uh, Mike, you had Dallas. It's, it's insane, by the way, that the Steelers are favored in this game. Like, if you go back to preseason and think about it, um, you, you've got Dallas as part of your teaser. I do, yeah. At eight and a half, I like Dallas in the teaser. Look, I, I think that from what we've seen from both of these teams so far, I don't think it's crazy that Pittsburgh was a one or one and a half point favorite on their home field in primetime. Like, I don't think that's crazy. Uh, 
I don't think the Steelers are built to be winning by multiple scores uh, against a team like Dallas. I know that Dak hasn't played incredibly well. I know their run game is really a question mark, but they've still got to contend with CeeDee Lamb. And I, I think CeeDee Lamb is special enough. And I think their kicking game, we have to remember the kicking game really on both sides, but Brandon Aubrey is phenomenal. I think this Dallas team is going to have this game tight and competitive. I do think that they're able to actually go win this game outright. I know that we have a lot of people that like the Steelers. I think the Steelers story is great. I love Justin Fields. I love what he brings in the run game. I love the way that they can manage a football game and just make it ugly and, and find a way to have a win in a one score game. Uh, but I think the Cowboys are still a talented football team. So I like them here in a teaser at eight and a half. Uh, I paired it with the Seattle Seahawks, which when I played it at six was down to Seattle's money line, essentially. So uh, give me Cowboys in a teaser leg plus eight and a half. Um, yeah. Brandon Aubrey can score from anywhere. They'll get a field goal from anywhere. Uh, can't Dallas from offense really can't score touchdowns though. I mean, they haven't been that impressive aside from that fourth quarter rally against Baltimore. And now they're facing a great defense with no Brandon cooks. Um, so I'm not expecting many touchdowns here. Um, and a lot of people are betting this game up over. We've seen the total go up. That seems to be the sharp side. I don't understand why. Um, I know the Cowboys have their defensive injuries up front. That doesn't mean Pittsburgh's and all, all of a sudden start throwing the ball around. You know, they, they just have not done that at all this year. That's not their MO. Um, and their offense has been allergic to scoring touchdowns starting from week one when they had six field goals and a win. Um, I think because of the de defensive injuries for Dallas, they're just going to turn the clock up running the ball. Um, with Justin Fields and Najee Harris and their run game. Um, so I disagree with the move. If I'm playing anything, it's going to be under 44. Uh, this could really be an 18 to 15 type of win for either side with uh, 11 field goals and no touchdowns in this game. And it wouldn't be <laughs> that shocking to me. Oh, God. I mean, Chris Collins were, I, I tell you, Mike, this guy can make a field goal from anywhere. My Chris Collinsworth is a, it's a, it's a work in, uh, it's a work in progress. We're working on that. Um, Monday night. Saints and Chiefs. Chiefs favored by five and a half. Uh, you know, we're, the Rasheed Rice thing is pretty crazy because we don't know. Like, like he, we thought he was done for the year, and now you know Andy Reid was so pessimistic, and then the reports that they've got to do more. You know, they're not sure what it is, and and now Andy Reid saying more imaging uh, doesn't seem likely. Obviously, that he would play uh, in this game, and and with the Saints suffering some injuries on the offensive line. Chris Jones could be a big problem uh, in that matchup. I mean, like he can wreck anything. Primetime at home, no Eric McCoy. Uh, Mike, you, you like the Chiefs in the spot, at least early on? I do like the Chiefs in the spot, especially if you're finding four or four and a half. The, I think there's going to be a lot of movement and continue to be movement on it here. Uh, honestly, I know a lot of people like the under in this game, and I could definitely see it getting there. Uh, but I see a strong start from Kansas City here in this one in the first half. I went over on their team total of 12 and a half. The idea of getting Kansas City at 13 points in the first half of the game is one that I like. I, I think that's where their home field advantage really comes into play. We know how, how good Andy Reid is off a of bye. I, it's also just having opening drives typically in situations like this. It's not a bye week, obviously, but it's one where I think that things have changed and they are a master at, you know, really game planning for those situations. But I also think it's Chris Jones. And I think that Saints offensive line, you know, the one way to turn Derek Carr into the pumpkin that throws the interceptions is to put pressure on him. And we know that Kansas City can do that. And it's a lot easier to do it at home on primetime when you've got the benefit of the crowd noise that really helps because you're not always able to go on certain, uh, you know, with verbal cadences uh, with the offensive line. So I think that helps Kansas City a lot here. Uh, ultimately, though, I think they get a touchdown in the first three drives uh, and potentially a second touchdown or multiple field goals here uh, from Harrison Bucker, who, again, who can kick from 60 yards. So I like this spot. Give me Kansas City's team total over 12 and a half in the first half. With that touchdown going to Noah Gray, we'll fire up your go. Noah Gray props for this game because they're yeah. gonna, with no receiver, with both receivers getting hurt, I don't think they're going to rely on Juju Smith-Schuster to be their their number one no. receiver. I think it's going to be all two tight ends and, and getting Gray more involved. Um, I'm surprised this total was moving up. Um, New Orleans defense has given up three touchdowns the last three weeks against Dallas, Philly, and Atlanta. It's pretty pretty solid offenses there. 
um, and the defense has been doing work. Kansas City's offense not look good right now, and, and they're now missing their expected top two receivers from the preseason, preseason top running back. Um, I don't know that they're going to score a ton um, unless they can unlock something with that multiple tight end set, uh, but their defense is going to win consistently against this New Orleans offensive line. They're going to follow that Philadelphia blueprint uh, of you know going heavy up front, and they have the personnel to do it. Um, it is possible, I guess, New Orleans offense can find success like Baltimore and Cincy did against this D. This D. Uh, uh, um, but uh, power ratings to the line's about right. I think there's a chance that Kansas City's overrated in power ratings. We'll see how these injuries affect them. Um, at least at this point of the season, just add three points to their power rating once you get to the playoffs because that's when they turn it on. Um, my best bet here is going to be under 43 and a half. Um, just looking for a good number here to play the under because this really seems to me like a game where the defenses outplay the offenses. I, th- I think there's actually a decent chance that the all's two plays are correlated here in the sense that if you get Kansas City above the 12 and a half. Like if they clear 14 points and hold New Orleans uh, under 10 in that first half, then I think we see a lot of, I don't know whether it's Carson Steele or like little, just just a lot of grinding the clock in the second half as Andy Reid is known to do when he has a lead. And you sort of force Derek Carr into dropping back a ton with Chris Jones in his face all the time. You get some turnovers. Again, you melt the clock more and more and just get out of town with a win. I don't think Kansas City has – I don't know if they, I mean they have the ability because they have Patrick Mahomes and maybe Kelsey has a good game and, and Gray is there, but uh, more than likely, you know, it's it's if you get a lead, you are just squeezing that clock uh, like an orange. All right, that is it for Week Five, but Week Six look ahead. RJ, you've got one for us. Yeah, I like taking the Ravens at minus six and a half. They're going to be at home against Washington. Washington is a team at peak value right now. Um, this line was expected to be double digits prior to week one. But the Washington offense has, has excelled, playing a run of really bad defenses. Um, so we'll see if Cleveland can stop that run. It's what's supposed to be a very good defense, but has been kind of up and down, especially on the road. Um, and, and if they, they do offer any resistance and Washington scores 20 or so, this line's going to shoot up, I think. Um, Baltimore likely coming into this game, putting up big points in three straight, assuming they can do it against Cincy um, because they just did it against Dallas and Buffalo. No question they're going to get into the 30s in this game. Um, And even if Washington does have success and wins that game, um, you know, how much lower is this line going to get? You're not going to make them lower than six, you know, against Baltimore. Um, So I think Baltimore being the top tier ratings, um, you're going to get a good number here or a solid number here either way. But this number could shoot up to eight, eight and a half pretty quickly. Um, So so lay it now if you can at the six and a half. Yeah, it's a good call. I mean, Ravens, Ravens are a truck right now. They, the offensive line, by the way, they might have figured it out. It looks a lot better than it did the first two weeks. Five homegrown guys, we talked about it, that, that are just, you know, just sort of need a little time to gel. And we've seen offenses improve rapidly uh, this season, especially like around week four. All right. That'll do it for us. That's all our best bets for week five. Let's cash those tickets for Mike, for RJ. I'm Brinson. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you guys later.